All right, so today we are going to talk about a few different projects um, that we have had the opportunity to implement on our operation. Um, our address is Lemon, South Dakota, but as you can see on the map, we're actually located over in southwestern North Dakota in Grant County. So right there on the border. Um, and the projects that we've been able to implement, uh, I just want to recognize right off the bat that that has been possible through uh, the farmer rancher SARE grants and so um, just wanted to recognize them right away and thank them for that opportunity um, to implement projects to take what we've learned and to continue to grow with it and to share with you all what we've learned along the way so um, to start off with I think Drew will take us through a bit of a history about the project area that we really focused on with um, this bale grazing effort kind of the resource concerns that we had and what led us to the point of considering bale grazing. And then we'll talk you through the different projects that we have continued to build on um, to basically improve that initial project. Our bale grazing area, we're kind of focusing, looking at this land here and how degraded it is. Um, it's what we first led us to bale grazing and this is not alkali areas, it's just a lack of topsoil. It blew away in the, well, from farming, from homesteading days. Um, so those are like high spots? Not always, no. It's some pretty low depressions. This over here is in a uh, creek bottom, but it's, the clay is all exposed and it all blew away. Um, this used to be farmed up until about this time and then they abandoned it and just let it grass back in because it wouldn't even raise an oats crop but speak louder Drew. okay <laughs> um so we're going to go on to 1995 you can see all these spots being more pronounced this is in hay production at this time so you're just taking nutrients away. You aren't just taking grain, you're taking the whole plant away every, every year. Um, this is where I currently live. And this is the areas that we expanded our bale grazing into after we saw what bale grazing would do for us. 2004, um, I was a junior in high school. You see all these washing? There's a bunch of hills that are on this side of the property and all that snow melt comes rushing down. There's quite a bit of erosion and there's also quite a bit of erosion that comes from the north. Um, so we deal with a lot of water and wind erosion. And the previous owner uh, had this area planted into alfalfa, which helped with the washouts, but they still were removing the hay and hauling it away. 2017 is when I took over and here I'm trenching water lines out to these hay fields and then I trenched over to put water over here. Um, so so as you can tell from some of those initial pictures, um, we obviously had some resource concerns. And um, just talking through those more specifically, one of our biggest concerns was the loss of soil um, due to wind and then poor water management carrying a lot of those resources off the land. Um, so just some examples of that. Up here you can see one of the fence lines around a hay field. Um, this had been historically farmed, so you can see that there's a pretty drastic drop. Um, and then the picture up here in the corner, that's that land to the north that Drew was talking about. It's not in our management, um, but for a number of years before that was in a perennial system, it was summer fouled every year. It's also higher up in elevation, so anytime that there'd be a big moisture event, all of that would come gushing down through um, a lot of those wetland or lowland areas in Drew's backyard. And when that came, it came with a lot of momentum 
and kept moving things downstream. So thinking about how we could slow that down was, was, part, of, um, was part of our management goal as well. And then um, a lot of those fields, once they quit farming them, like Drew said, they let them just kind of naturally grass back in, started using them for grazing, but it wasn't under any type of a management plan. So your typical um, areas uh, where the cattle would really just spend a lot of time overgrazing, causing some compaction. Um, anytime the wind blows, this is kind of what it can look like. So this is just over the hill um, where our folks live. And then after a lot of those windy days, um, this next clip is actually in the road ditch that usually gets hayed. So um, our other big resource concern, like I said, was water management. This is kind of on the backside of Drew's yard. Um, over here, there's a culvert. That culvert catches all that water from the field to the north. Looking at the water, you can see it's pretty dark and dirty. And that just blasts through um, his fields. Not only in these low areas, but just, you know, it, it really bothers us when we, we get a good rain or we have those snow melts and we see all the water leave our place. Um, so anything that we can do to figure out how to capture that, infiltrate it more into our soil, we're always looking out for, for options like that. Um, in terms of you know, what it looked like on those, those hilltops or even in the low areas, this is kind of where the production was at. Um, lots of exposed clay pans, really not a whole lot of topsoil left. That far picture you can see um, soil type would drastically change within a small distance. So uh, it was an interesting piece of ground to come into. So going into bale grazing, um, this is after year one of bale grazing and it's kind of hard to see, but you can see little dark spots here. And that's, we did rows of bales out there, about a week's worth of hay at a time, and this is the season after. So there's a lot less exposed um, soil just because of the composting, but the healthier vegetative state of the plants too. Um, not sure what's going on here. Huh. So that was 2019, which was also a it was a wet year for us. Um, Can you maybe explain what bale grazing is in case anybody was not comfortable with that? So it's a winter feeding strategy for us. Um, it's different for everybody. For us, we put bales out in the field or we leave them out in the field and we let the cows eat for a week's worth of time without starting a tractor or anything. We use an electric fence to allow the cows into another group of bales and another group of bales throughout the winter. Um, some people put it on a truck and haul it out once a week or once every 10 days. It's, it's whatever works for you, but it's reducing your fuel usage and feeding where you want nutrients. Did you make the bales in that field or did they come from another field? Some of them got made in that field and some got hauled in from some CRP land that we had to haul the hay anyway. And then but do you focus on the bare spots or did you just do it as blanket? There's enough bad spots in that field that <laughs> any anything is a good okay. spot. Thank so So I won't spend a whole lot of time on this one, but we'll get into it more um, in the last two projects. But I guess uh, I wanted to put this up there for the first project. Um, partially because it, it did show some immediate responses to bale grazing. But basically uh, what you're looking at is on um, 
the slide, there's the historic sample site. So this is in that hay field where we first began bale grazing, but prior to ever doing it. Um, and then on the right side, fall of 2019, um, there's a few different categories. So that, that first year we bale grazed, that whole area was planted to a cover crop. Um, so you have the cover crop only column. Then we took samples that were directly underneath the bales that were grazed within that area that had the cover crop. So again, the cattle had access to both the cover crop as well as the bales um, for that winter. And then the indirect impact is samples that were collected within that area, but not directly underneath the bale. And um, I guess in general, um, pH, we didn't necessarily see a whole lot of difference between historic and, um, or excuse me, we did see a little difference between the historic and fall of 2019, but not you know a large amount by any means. Um, looking at M, P, and K, we did see more positive responses, especially underneath that direct impact. So when we saw that, that's something that you know the more that we can create that impact, the more bales, the more um, we can spread that out, the better for us. Um, lots of people are always interested in the organic matter levels, and uh, you know, for us, we recognize that takes time, and this ground was pretty, I guess, inactive for so long that we didn't really anticipate seeing much response to organic matter for a few years. Um, just a matter of reactivating those microorganisms, and then not only that, but also beginning to incorporate the litter, and then that eventually being broken down. So. Um, we'll come back to a lot of these same nutrient levels as we move forward into future years. Um, so after we did that first bale grazing project, um, we saw, I guess, enough positive responses that it encouraged us to continue doing it, not only um, to continue doing it, but also to spread out our impact onto some of the ac other acres that we manage. And we also became interested in incorporating sheep alongside the cattle in that type of system. Um, we wanted to see if there was better ways that they could utilize that forage or different ways. We were also really intrigued by um, how they would behave and how that would ultimately affect their manure distribution across that landscape. And if there was a way that we could also capitalize, you know, and kind of diversify our operation, diversify our cash flow, those would all be potential win-wins for us. So we just wanted to experiment with that um, and, and see how it would go. So in general for this um, multi-species grazing, bale grazing project um, that took place during 2020 and 2021 uh, throughout the summers, we spent a lot of time just making some basic modifications to incorporate the sheep. Um, we did soil samples every year, set up the bale grazing. Like Drew said, we tried to use bales that were put up on those acres. We didn't necessarily want to um, you know, mine away those nutrients. We wanted to keep as many of those nutrients there as possible. And if there was opportunities to um, get a good deal and purchase hay from other people and bring their nutrients into our operation. Those were things, those were things that we would also consider. Um, so this is kind of what the project area looked like. Um, as you can see here, we really focused on 2020 um, and the winter of 21 in just a small area. And to be honest, that was partially because we weren't really sure how it was going to go with sheep. Um, we grew up with sheep, we were familiar with them, but we hadn't ever put them out in the winter. And we were trying to make as little modifications to our fences as possible. So a lot of the perimeter fences um, are maintained with two wire electric high tensile. And in any low areas, we would maybe add a third wire, um, but trying to really minimize the changes if we could. So to do the bale grazing in this area, because it's a small area, 
um, and we were trying to feed quite a number of animals, we would set up so much for a certain time frame, and then we would have to go back out and set it up again. So we just did that a few times, picked the nice days in the winter to turn on the tractor, and it worked pretty well. Um, and then in 21 and 22, you can see we spread out that area quite a bit. Um, when we set up a lot of our bale grazing areas, uh, you know, our, our starting point always is oriented around the water. So we start there with the first strip and then just kind of keep going from there. And for us, we try to set up as much as we can in the fall before the ground freezes, just makes life a lot easier. Um, other, th other things to point out, I guess, would be the historic sample site is over in this area and some of the other areas we continued with are over here. So like Aaron said before, modifications to fences, um, a lot of the perimeter uh, was barbed wire or two wire high tensile electric. We just, we'd add an electric wire to the high, or to the barbed wire fences and we would add an electric wire to some of the two wire um, electric ones anyway. And then in the bale grazing area itself, we just use a fiberglass post of these clips with sheep. We'd have to have two or three of these poly wires in order to keep the sheep in, especially when it was late fall and there was a little bit of green growth underneath the, the areas on the hay field because the sheep would rather eat that than hay. And again in the spring, um, and the first year we did it was pretty easy because when we would run out of hay in those five little rotations, I was able to have the hay hauler call him up and he would haul hay in and drop the bales and I wouldn't have to transport them twice. But anyway, so we were looking at grazing behavior with the sheep and the cows. It kind of surprised us that once the, the sheep would get into a bale, they'd, they'd break in before the cows on their preferred bale. They'd eat what they want, and then the rest of the day they'd just spend going out, digging in a little bit of snow and grazing grass and eating gum weed and things that you wouldn't think that they would really want to eat when they've got green hay sitting there, but that's what they did. The cows, they would break into a bale after the sheep found the good bales and they would just eat there and then they'd loaf there and they laid on a lot more hay than the sheep did. Uh, 2020, the area that we stuck with was a really depleted clay hill. Um, we ended up going over it three different times before the end of the winter which created a really good ground cover, high impact, and uh, a lot of mulching. It was, we're still seeing some of that residue break down. 21, we expanded the bale grazing area, um, which was good because you, once you start seeing results, you want it everywhere, but also when you spread it out, you spread out your results too, so. Um, in this picture, you can see our windbreaks that we, we got. They provide some shelter for the sheep underneath. And the cows can't get into it. For the most part, this winter, they didn't use the windbreaks. They would just stay behind bales. And because why would you stand behind a steel windbreak when you can stand behind a bale and eat? And but. One other thing, and I guess a bigger difference between those two winters is that um, in 21 and 22, we also ended up uh, calving out in the bale grazing area. Um, and as that green grass was, or as the grass was greening up, excuse me, um, you know, they also behaved differently in the bale grazing units as well. So pushing them to clean up became a little bit more challenging. Um, but it was nice also to have that bedding out there for the calves as well. So there was some kind of give and take on, on how that worked when we were calving, but. What do you do with the net 
We just leave the net wrap on the bale and it keeps the cows from breaking into a large amount of bales at once. Um, they will walk from one end of the field to the other to see which bale they want to break into. And if they have a, like this year they're eating oats bales, whatever reason, and they'll eat those to the ground before they break into the next ones. And then we pick up the net wrap on nice days or in the spring. But yeah. It's better than... Any problem with the choking on it? No, they push it off to the side and you just pick it up. Sometimes it gets buried a little bit with some hay and when they're in the springtime and that stuff is breaking down a little bit, you pick it up then. But So here it is, one winter. Um, they look pretty happy just laying around. They're getting a little bit of windbreak from from the snow banks actually instead of being in the, the windbreaks. Um, typical, you'll see the cows and sheep together. They don't operate or don't stay in separate areas. Um, you can see uh, in this picture the bales are tipped on end and that's also so it deters the cows from breaking into them all at once. It and also creates a different, it also creates um, a bit of a area where the snow doesn't accumulate. So, um, you know, there's People do bale grazing in many different ways, but from our experience, anytime we've left it on their side, it ends up creating a snow drift rather than a space where the animals can actually bed up next to it and find some windbreak. So um, we try to wait as long as we can in the fall before we go out, spread those bales and tip them on end because innately, as soon as you tip them on end, it's you know gonna infiltrate any, any potential rain, which is gonna reduce the quality of that forage. So. If we can hold off on doing that, um, the later into the season, the better for us. So everybody talks about the waste. Um, this is after we were done with the rotation, there isn't a whole lot of waste left. And this is what a lot of times the cows do. They just kind of push that net wrap off to the side or you see it in a circle because They'll reach up to the top of that bale and they'll just push it down as they're eating that bale. And then you just go over and you pick up and there's a ring of net wrap. But, uh, we started it, we would go back in in the spring and we'd run a harrow across this residue to break it up and to distribute it. And then we kind of decided, what are we doing? We're putting more time and diesel fuel into this. So we started just saving this hay field wherever we did it that winter and we'll graze it the next spring. The cows go in, the hoof action disturbs that residue and distributes a little bit more. They eat a little bit of weeds or whatever's volunteered because if you feed millet or cover crop bales that have mature seed, you're gonna see some turnips growing. You're gonna have this, that, and the other. And it, it's, um, it's a learning process for <laughs> for you too, as as much as it is for the livestock. This winter, um, it's a little different with the snow. You get a lot of manure on top of the snow. Um, then the snow blows over. Um, over here is just sheep manure. Um, it's. And uh, in this project, we also were interested in you know, just not just the distribution of the manure from the cattle versus sheep, but um, a lot of times the cattle manure is going to break down differently than sheep. Sheep's drier. Uh, they chew their food more, so there's less weed seeds. We're just kind of observing what was going on there. Um, then the residue breaks down. This was this this summer after we did a cutting, these bale spots are the only spots that regrew because we didn't get rain from July 4th on. So when you look at some of the soil tests, even if they aren't impressive, they're still giving you a forage response, which is kind of interesting. 
Okay, so from this project, um, took samples in the fall of 2020, 2021, and then in the spring following that final bale grazing year. Uh, this slide's just focusing on our macronutrients, N, P, and K. Um, traditional sample is what most of you are probably used to seeing on a soil test. And then the available is based on the, um, the Haney soil test, if you're familiar with that, and what is projected to be available um, based on microbial activity the following year. So um, interesting to look at you know, what's happening from one year to the next. And in the summer of 2021, uh, we were very dry, um, yet I think it was around August, September, we got hit with a lot of moisture, um, probably close to 10 inches or more, which is not normal for us. So even though overall we're seeing, you know, a trend that's increasing, um, looking at, at some of these levels during that summer and fall, what we uh, expect happened is that for some of those um, nutrients that are soluble, they were just simply leached down into the soil profile further. And it's not that they aren't there, it's just that we weren't detecting them in that soil sample that we collected at the, at the surface. So um, that was something that, you know, really didn't bother us too much, um, knowing it's potentially just deeper in the profile, knowing that this isn't a perennial system and those roots will have access to it in the future. And again, this is just some of those other micronutrients. Why do you think your pH went up so much back in that? It was 7 and 6.9 before why do you think it went up? That was a different spot. This was tested on that clay hill that we went three times over. Oh. Okay. That's part of the reason we spent so much time in that area. <laughs> we, were, we wanted to see a big response and we didn't on the traditional nitrogen, which leaching. Um, so now I just have some pictures of the forage response here. That's that field where we took those soil samples. Um, you can really see the high amount of impact. 2022, um, we spread out all across this area. So on the ground, this is kind of what it looks like in two different types of conditions. One where there's a lot of seasonal moisture, things are growing well, responding. You can see there's lots of sweet clover out here. You can still see the dark green circles of the bales. This is, um, yeah, later in the season, September, October. So conditions are getting more limited, but this is still a an area where you see that nice dark green. You can also see it's thicker. It's a little bit taller, more lush in general. Um, and at the end, we have some drone footage going over one of the bale grazing areas from this last year. And it's always interesting to look at these aerial images in the year in which your conditions are really restricted because that, you know, everything that you need to work on or that is having decent responses really pops out on those years. Are you guys doing any gr growing season grazing on this land or is it just for feeding in the winter? Those acres are either being grazed as a perennial or if they're not grazed, they'll get baled. And going into our project that we're starting now, um, so with this whole carbon trouble that is going on in the world, um, everybody's wanting to, 
either ignore it or capitalize on it or do something with carbon. Um, and all these different companies, they want to test your soil and pay you for the carbon in your soil, but are they testing just the top six inches? Are they testing your subsoil? How deep do they go down? Because, you know, there's, there's carbon a long ways down in your soils. And how do you build carbon? Well, you can either overwhelm it on the surface so you can build, but your topsoil is your highest point of carbon already. So we started thinking that if you can, if you could get this residue, manure, urine, from the bale grazing deeper into the soil profile, you're getting into an area that might be 1% organic matter. Something that in our area is hard and compact and the biological life isn't, isn't thriving. We're already struggling with water infiltration issues from past years. Um, so I had experimented with some key line cultivation and pasture settings with a different implement. Um, and then we wanted to combine this to get both water, water management and to get nutrients and carbon and feed the biological life in our subsoil, not just the topsoil. Um, part of the other issue is, is how much of your nutrients volatilize and just go to the atmosphere. I mean, your old dead grass, or it carbonizes and you lose it, but it does provide ground cover. So what is key line cultivation? Um, so normally when a rain event happens, water will run off of your high spots and go into the valleys and it concentrates more and more flows feed and then you get washouts in your fields that's kind of what's been happening to the east of my house and so this guy in australia pa yeomans he started cultivating his land slightly off contour so he would go into these valleys and he would run these the subsoiler, essentially, down out to the ridge. He had to do some survey work to where he would have a, a drop. And when we did it, we did about one foot every 50 feet of driving. So the water just basically comes from its concentration points in the valley and it gets redirected out to your ridges your ridges are sandy, your ridges need the moisture because they're what eroded, and um, it's just another water management tool for us. But it also would transport that manure down those subsoil slits. Most of our hayfield grasses are like intermediate wheatgrass or western wheatgrass. There's some switchgrass and other species, but they're all deep-rooted. Uh, the shorter-rooted grasses would be more introduced, like crested wheatgrass, and it's not really a desirable, so it wasn't a, an issue. So Drew kind of talked about this, but... Um with this project, we wanted to continue to evaluate the usefulness of bale grazing and combining the benefits of that system um, and considering how key line cultivation could be used in conjunction with it to begin to sequester that carbon, um, continue to promote that nutrient cycling, and hopefully increase some forage production. Go ahead. And in general, our timeline kind of follows the same concept of our previous projects. Continued with the, we'll continue with the annual soil sampling, um, putting up hay, getting it set up for bale grazing. Um, 
We installed all of our key lines this fall, which there'll be a map kind of showing you the areas that we were really focusing on. And then our goal in the next um, couple of seasons is to make sure that we can get across those areas and bale graze in them. And in particular, um, try to continue to do this with the sheep with the hope that their manure, as that runoff occurs, um, can get distributed into the bottom of those key lines. So this is a map of the project area. Again, any of the areas highlighted in yellow is where we ended up going out this fall and running the key lines. So um, as you can see in this picture, it's a minimal disturbance. It has a shank that'll go down the ground about 18 to 24 inches. It has a coulter in the front of it, and it leaves a fairly nice slit in the ground. Um, should have had a bigger tractor attached to it, but I was having a little hard time steering, so I had to have a bale in the front of the tractor to keep the <laughs> keep steering. Um, but <laughs> but this is the end result, and. It, uh, what I was using before in the pasture was quite a bit more disturbance, and I, I didn't want that in the hayfield. I wanted to be able to bale graze over the top of this and then follow up with running equipment over the top. Where in the pasture, I didn't really like it to begin with, but it also created an opportunity that I could overseed it and introduce legumes into my pastures that were a little overrun with crested wheat and yeah, other species. Um, so these slits, if I get hay and manure down into these slits, it'll provide a cool, moist environment. And we're assuming or we're hoping that we're going to lose less nutrients to volatilization once it's into there. Um, this winter, it looks like we're going to have some runoff because all the snow we've got. But on an open winter, you know, we might have to run out there with a harrow to disturb, to move some of this manure and experiment in some areas, but not the others. But hopefully, we just get runoff and we don't have to worry about it. But um, it also opens up the ground to let oxygen go to those microbes. Uh, last year we attended this conference and there was a guy here that talked about your soil compaction and the level of compaction that basically starved the microbes from living. Um, so you need air, food, and water for these microbes. Um, so it's kind of hard to see, but if you get a little imaginative, this is with the snow on it this winter. When we first started getting snow, that ground was opened up. The snow was melting and going down those slits, filling up. So instead of the sun coming out and that snow evaporating and just going away, there was moisture going in the ground. And this is actually in the pasture right next to it with the other tool that I have. So you see this added ground disturbance, but you can see the water being redirected and staying in those. And I mean, this event was probably a half inch of rain and it would have been down the slope and gone. I can see how you wouldn't want that in your hay cutting field, but I can also see if it did that counter to the washes that they create a sort of a dam too. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, they don't follow the direct contour of the land because otherwise they fill up and then they run over to the next. Uh, but if they're slightly off, then they, they'll run a long ways and then they find a little pocket of sand or whatever and 
the water is going in the ground, it might make it to an aquifer, it might water your hayfield, irrigate, whatever, but it's doing better than going down the creek and being in Mississippi. So that picture on the right is the same tool? That's your subsoiler? That's a subsoiler that I used, but it didn't have the, the no-till disturbance shank on it, so it 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 just caused a little bit more disturbance. So it'd peel out these little lumps rather than just splitting the ground open. What would what you have done had to do to the tool to get it so it didn't throw it so much? Was all in the all in the shank. The it was a straight shank that goes down with a point forward in the front and it's got a coulter to cut open the sod rather than to pull it open. Um, I probably have some photos here at the end. So um, with this, you know, we only were able to kind of collect some samples um, this spring and these samples are, are, we're gonna be able to compare them at some point to this historic sample site, but what we're primarily interested in, and I think what's kinda important or something to consider for today is, you can see um, with these initial samples, from the samples at zero to six to six to 24, um, you know, we're really hoping to see improvement deeper into that soil profile. So in the future, these samples will become kind of our baseline for comparison. Um, but um, so we did a Haney test. Um, that's what this CO2C is. Um, it's the respiration or burst test, and it's an indication of your biological life. So you can see a dramatic drop the deeper down you are. Um, so we're hoping with the oxygen, the food, the moisture that this number will greatly increase. Um, when you look into building organic matter, it takes quite a while to go from that composting stage to actually becoming organic matter. Uh, so we may end up using this number to to judge whether the biological life in five years will increase the organic matter or not with this project, because that's just the life of the project is you know, a two-year project with Sarah. But is S04S? Sulfur. It's uh, soluble. And I, uh, when you dig down in that soil in that area, it, there's actual yellow chunks of sulfur in there. So, so aside from the nutrients, um, within those key lines, we also want to monitor what effect we actually do have on that soil moisture, both horizontally and vertically, um, and then. Like Drew mentioned, compaction is another thing we'll look at. Um, I believe that gentleman that was here last year said at 300 pounds of pressure, that's when you really dramatically reduced the potential for biological activity. So we'll just kind of track those levels over time uh, with a penetrometer and hopefully we can take those um, at multiple depths as well as um, distances away from those lines. And then, um, you know, Carl already left the room, but um, if you don't know Carl Hoppy, he's in the center over here. He's the SARE coordinator for North Dakota. Um, and he's been a valuable resource for us in terms of just being able to kind of share our experiences with this project. Um, he's coordinated some opportunities to have some tours through the place and, um, I don't know, uh, Drew probably has a different opinion on this than I do, but um, 
any time that we can just share some practical knowledge and experience with producers um, and kind of give them the tools to figure out what fits their operation is um, something that I enjoy doing and helping them that like just because we implement a project one way on our farm like it doesn't mean that it has to look that way on their farm and encourage them to figure out what's going to fit their operation. So in our experience, um, going to a lot of the traditional outreach uh, tours or educational sessions sometimes hasn't really been that valuable. And so we've tried to kind of create different opportunities for producers to find that. Um, and with this project, one of the things that we've done is create a mailbox tour. Um, in our neighborhood, the neighbors aren't gonna come up to you and ask you what you're doing and why you're doing it and how it's gonna work because they don't wanna show you that they're actually interested in it. Um, they have a heart, like, you know, it's just strange, but they don't wanna admit that, but you'll catch them out there looking at your water tank or you'll catch them slowly driving by while you're putting these key lines in and they're never going to ask you about it, but they're watching. So if we're gone at a conference like this and they happen to drive up to this mailbox and grab some papers out of there that share accurately what we're doing, we're hoping that that will help rather than them just, you know, presuming what's going on out there. But um, Drew probably has some comments. <laughs> Well, part of it is is the property west of where I live is right along the highway, and any time you're doing anything, it seems like one of our neighbors drives by at about 15 miles an hour, you know, and he just keeps an eye on the place, you know, and and he doesn't ask, but he'll ask your uncle, he'll, you know, so <laughs> there, there's, we wanted to put it out there in a just a non-traditional route and it's hard to capture because of how effective it is you know it's being used you know people are noticing but nobody admits to it you know i mean it's <laughs> you mentioned to one person oh i saw you out there checking out that winter water tank oh <laughs> When was that? You know, and oh, and then they start talking. Yeah, you know, it's it's been interesting, and some people you just see them starting to implement things when you're driving anywhere, and you're like, oh, well, that's new that they're bale grazing now, and where did they, you know, where did they start that from? But then there's some, you know, we we have been interviewed on podcasts, and there's been articles and you know, the other traditional routes, um, but. Uh, future considerations. Um, so the first year we did this with sheep, we, we were wanting to do some fall lambing. So we didn't have used bread in the, for the spring lambing. They were a little older, they were quite good condition and then they went out with the cows, they were in really good condition. They, they didn't really use any of the windbreaks. They'd use them every once in a while, but it was more to just loafing in the, out of the sun. And then this winter, um, we've got a mix of ewe lambs for replacements. There was some young ewes, some old ewes, some this, that, and the other. And, it's kind of hard to do a one size fits all. So for us, it became more important to make sure all the sheep that are gonna be going out into bale grazing are in good body condition or you sort them off and keep them in until they are. Um, shelter, well, we got... We've got lots of portable windbreak and we planted trees, but those trees are small and the windbreaks after two blizzards filled up with snow. And so then the sheep were out 
lounging behind bales, which was fine until um, until another blizzard happens and you feel sorry for them. And then we had some predator issues because of placing haystacks right next to our bale grazing area. Well, predators need habitat to survive blizzards too, so it was kind of like putting things a little too close. And there, there was some predator issues. Um, we wanted to bring in sheep, but during the storms they wouldn't, they wouldn't leave where they wanted to be. Um, they had bonded with the cows and the snow was pretty darn deep at that point. So it was, you know, you can only do what you can do and you, you learn every year. But supplementation, um, one year we had a creeper panel so that way the sheep could come and go and get into better quality hay. And we found that they just wanted to be with the cows. And I don't know if that would have been the same this year or not. Um, it's it's kind of hard to predict an animal's habit or, <laughs> but yeah. So here's some of the drone footage that was taken in, was it August? Yeah. <laughs> so this is in August after, when did it quit raining? July, July 4th. 4th. It basically quit raining. So uh, this is coming kind of off the big hill to the east of Drew's place. Um, it'll eventually make a, a swoop around to the north, but lots of runoff comes out through these fields. And in this area over here is where we started installing those key lines this fall. Now you can see I'm starting to haul hay into that field for, for bale grazing. That's the odd placed, the odd placed bales. Um, this area here, we bale grazed on last winter. You don't see much residue or and down here too. Um, I calved in here and here because I still had bales that it's good when you have extra hay. So instead of lining them up, stacking up or whatever, I just kept feeding through calving. And as the drone rotates, you can kind of see the waterways here. This is north of the house. And they concentrate and then they come down through a culvert here and wash down through the property. And you said that field was grass now? It was planted back to alfalfa a few years ago. Yeah, it's, that's, uh, it's a neighbor's. Yeah. Yeah. But is your goal to winter graze, but do bales as a backup or do you just want them to be? Um, you can't really rely on winter grazing when you get 60 inches of snow. We, we had a bunch of hay fields that I didn't cut this year. The intermediate wheat grass and western wheat grass and switch grass with alfalfa mix. It was standing about this tall. Just getting ready to graze it. <laughs> and then those blizzards happened and it's flat on the ground or it's so deep in snow that the cows won't even go to it. I mean, so it's, it's kind of hard for us to rely on that. We've swath grazed some and again you don't know if you're going to get a windstorm and it's all going to blow into the trees. We swathed some this fall at mom and dad's place and then we had to go with pitchforks and clean it out of the new planting of trees because it buried. I mean it pick up, ball, ball up those windrows. Have you ever heard of piling? Yeah. I've tried kicking bales out with no net wrap or anything, basically making a pile. And, oh, what I and, downgrade. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very familiar with that practice. That's the wind issue with the swaths. 
so this here we're intensively grazing sheep down through the wetland area below. Um, we get these funnels of wind that come through and so you can go from I mean a couple hundred yards and there'll be snow or there's absolutely nothing blowing and it, it just it's pretty hard to manage and mom and dad's area they got a lot of trees but some years it funnels the wind and some years it really blocks it you can see here all the green from the bale grazing residues and some lines here where I scratched in some key lines in 